to this week's edition of the Detroit Astronomical Colloquium in Heidelberg, it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Martin Lukic from McMaster University, who will talk about radiative feedback and information of massive stars and star clusters. So, as you may know, Ralph is spending a one year sabbatical with us here in Heidelberg on a position that is joined between the Center for Astronomy and the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy. Let me say a few words about his person. He studied in British Columbia, then went for a postdoc to Cambridge, then to Johns Hopkins University. He also in between spent some time in Berkeley, and he could have stayed at Johns Hopkins University, but he decided to come back to Canada, and he is then since at Mark, uh, McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, where he soon became professor and where he became, in particular, the founding director of the Origins Institute about 10 years ago, I think, 9 to 10 years ago, and he stepped down from this position and now he has time to do research again. And he will talk to us today about his latest findings on the effects of radiative feedback on star and star cluster. So, let's welcome Professor Kutus. Uh, so, in the work I want to talk to you about today, uh, this is research that's at the heart of two of my PhD students' uh, theses. Uh, the first part of my talk will be on massive star formation feedback, that is with Mark Mikael Klassen and a group from Germany, from Wolf Kuiper, Thomas Peters, and Tony Banerjee. Um, <clears throat> indeed, this work, the first ideas about doing this work actually came out a hundred years ago as I was speaking with people here in Heidelberg, a uh, well-known world center in this kind of research, actually. My second project was led by my student, my student Corey Howard, with uh, Bill Harris as a co-supervisor and research here supported by Canada, but also through our joint collaborators, the DFK. So, let me get started with this. I, my talk is very simple. I'm simply going to talk about first the environments in which clusters of stars and massive stars form. And then I'm going to focus and drill in on massive stars and uh, simulations we've been doing on radiative feedback, indicating how they form, and then go up to back to the cluster scale to understand that environment as a place in which the radiative feedback effects are necessary to understand what would limit cluster mass, just as we're trying to understand what limits the massive, massive stars in that, uh, on the first part problem. So first of all, the environments. We know through uh, galactic plane surveys, here this is a Canadian galactic plane survey, the mid-plane in the interstellar medium, uh, the diffuse gas in the galaxy is a tortured place. It is lashed by supernova explosions and winds, uh, and ionizing radiation that create this highly structured, bubble-dominated, high-flow-ridden region uh, that we call home. Home to regions of star formation, which in the molecular gas here in the submillimeter mass, we see inherit this tortured filamentary structure down to the scales where the gas has become self-gravitating, uh, seen in these extinction maps. Here we're on scales of tens of parsecs, uh, on this cloud and zooming into a few parsecs in this subpiece around here is where the Oort C cluster is forming. So these are clearly somehow related to one another. Um, the recent advance in understanding the physics of this filamentary medium has been made possible by Herschel observations, among others. But it was the Herschel observations uh, that showed conclusively that filaments are the basic thing that clouds are made of, the basic structures in which molecular clouds are composed, it's this uh, kind of a spaghetti or filaments, sometimes parallel to one another, um, on scales ranging from a parsec or so, right up to 100 parsec type of scales. So a multi-scale feature that's filamentary on it. And the neat thing that's been discovered is that the individual dense cores, regions that will form perhaps a star or two, densities of 10 to 4 particles per cc, scales 0.04 parsecs in here, or low mass stars formation, 
are always tightly associated with filaments. The physics interesting point is that these are regions that are, that are gravitationally unstable. Um, uh, that is where their mass preemit length exceeds a simple, uh, um, this, should, this is the sound speed squared over G of the gas. So if the gas is thermal, this is about a 16 solar mass per parsec is the typical uh, mass loading that you need to fracture this gas gravitationally. I think uh, one of the most important aspects of these observation theorists is that we got there first, perhaps. There's a general understanding that given that molecular clouds were always observed to have supersonic turbulence within them, uh, theorists took this very seriously starting in the mid-90s and started to develop um, more and more detailed computer models as to what would happen to a cloud that's lashed with supersonic turbulence. And here is a scheme which you can see four different times in which a low-mass cluster of stars is formed here. Uh, the basic point is that in both simulations and basic theory, we have a, we have a framework now that didn't exist before the mid-1990s or 2000, by which we can refer our thinking to how stars of all kinds of masses and clusters form. By the way, if you stir this gas continuously, well, it will continue to lash it. If you leave off the stirring, then the turbulence will decay as one well over time. And all the simulations I'm going to show you today are for decaying turbulence. Okay? So the cloud is struck, stirred up, and then um, that turbulent energy gradually decays. You see gas flows along filaments, and towards regions where filaments cross, you see particularly important regions developing in the observations, such as here. The idea being that when you see uh, several filaments joining one another, there you typically find a region where a cluster of stars forms, and indeed that's where you tend to locate massive star formation. Okay. Uh, indeed, there's this whole idea now of filament hub systems in which, uh, which uh, cluster uh, formation occurs. Um, here is a simulation of how feedback in such a cloud would work. This is from work of uh, Dale and Al a few years ago. A 10 to 6 solar mass cloud with lots of clusters forming in and stars. Um, its radiation input in the cloud radiation does very little to make to wreck this cloud up in their simulations. So just a little foreshadowing about towards the latter part of my talk here about the effect of photoionization when you're in a more massive cloud regime. Like the clouds are 10 to 5, 10 to 6 solar masses at the peak end in the galaxy. What other physical processes are important here? Well, um, here's a filament in which we have the benefit of having a mapping here of a magnetic field structure in a region in the serpent south cloud. Here's a small cluster that's forming, and uh, you see that the magnetic field here tends to be perpendicular to the filament. A lot of people think that this may have some insight as to how these filaments form, the magnetic field being strong and diffuse interstellar medium, managed to, to, to uh, channel gas along field lines, uh, creating these kind of filamentary structures. This is a very active topic of research, and if you write a HOMA proposal to do this kind of work, I dearly hope the TAC will pay attention to you, because this is a, a very important question in this whole problem. Finally, radiative feedback in the late little while in this region of massive star formation. This is a filamentary region that's broken up into a series of uh, OB associations. Here's an OB cluster, perhaps 200 solar masses. And you can see here the effects of multiple massive stars that are starting to take apart this molecular cloud. But you see it isn't gone. It's blasted away chips and bits here, but it has not disappeared yet. How long can it exist in that state is an interesting question. Let's go now and drill down this slide to the scale of individual massive stars now. So uh, we'll now ask the question, we haven't really asked the question yet of what determines the ultimate mass of clusters, how massive can they become. Um, we do know that in our galaxy that answer is about 10 to 4 solar masses in stars, maybe a little bit more. A massive, most massive cloud is 10 to the 6. Is there a relation between those two masses? Going down to massive stars, we see from the data that there's some evidence for stars that exceed 150 solar masses. That is a challenge to form. 
and this has been one of the drivers for a lot of research I'm going to be talking about today, is how do you get to a mass that high? And given the physical constraints, I'll talk to you in just about a moment. A great place to look for the hunting grounds for the dense gas cores that may give rise to star formation, so you can learn about their initial conditions, can be found in these so-called infrared dark clouds. And here is a particularly uh, interesting map of, of a piece of one of these. <coughs> Um, with the dark with the cross is indicating places where you have massive cores, <clears throat> which will be the home, presumably, of massive stars. So, while you have this highly turbulent region, creating filaments, there still seem to be these islands, these dense pockets, which we always call the cores, <clears throat> which even are associated perhaps with massive star formation, not just low mass star formation. Here, the critical condition for fragmenting a filament that these regions are quite turbulent. You want to use the turbulent velocity square here, and not just the thermal velocity, because the mass loading in these things can be 600 solar masses per parsec, way above what the uh, math, what the sensibility of the area is for thermal gas at this temperature. So you either support this filament somehow by turbulence, or it should have rapidly collapsed with that kind of mass loading. So, uh, the kind of typical condition here, we see 100 solar mass type of cores in regions of about 0.1 parsec. So this is great news for a theorist to uh, go about uh, studying this. Finally, uh, going right down now, we do see massive stars, in, uh, where massive stars are associated with disks. These can be Keplerian. Here are two beautiful examples of this. Uh, Keplerian disk in this system that's associated with Outflow, you see the ionization effects of the massive star buried in here. And over here, um, at least the work of a lot of people from the MKIA, recent MOLA data showing a disk like region with Kepler flow, so here's the rotation axis, red and blue rotation around this axis, a Kepler A curve with bipolar outflow. <coughs> and this is then all the elements of the paradigm of low mass star formation which always had it, but you had a uh, disk with some part of a jet outflow, probably originating from the disk itself, um, and um, the, all the elements of that collapse of the core in a magnetized medium. Are we seeing that process here yet again? That's the multi-million dollar question for this problem. Okay, with that review of environments, um, let me get to the theoretical issues now and talk about massive star formation itself. This is a revered and ancient problem in theoretical astrophysics. Ancient being before I got my PhD. It's 1980. Um, so we see the work by theorists, um, including Hal Lorch, who was in Germany for many years, leading a group. The idea being that it's for spherical fall, it's quite easy to compute for a gas given with some opacity. Radiation force works on the dust grains, uh, that puts radiation pressure on the cloud, and you can easily calculate a limit um, of how massive a star can be for the radiation pressure to just blows the gas away in the spherical accretion problem. And that limit is somewhere, depending on your opacity, but it's 40 solar masses in spherical accretion. Uh, people realize quite quickly that um, you, the way to break out of this is that the material collapsed into a disk. It might be possible for the radiation to be intercepted by the disk, re radiated vertically in a kind of a flashlight effect, so that that allowed continued disk accretion through the mid plane onto the star as a way of avoiding this. This breaking of symmetry is extremely important in this model. So, this work was pursued. And, and this axisymmetric disk calculations were first done um, by uh, Lurk and Sonalter, most famously, also found a kind of a limit to how massive the star could be. This time, what happened was, as you can see from the, took this from their paper, um, you can see that the star here, earlier phase is about 60,000 years of evolution, get to this point from a disk, um, we completely destroyed the disk by the radiation heating. What's now realized, as uh, Walt Piper pointed out, was that the resolution of that simulation being too low, that you were unable to resolve the dust sublimation front in here. 
Inside some radius, I destroy the dust by the rate of heating, so there's no opacity to that gas, and it can flow onto the star. If you don't resolve that region, you're in the part of the you're probably seeing heavy, dusty gas, which is absorbing radiation like mad, and that does not allow you to flow smoothly. So you get a lot of heating of the disk, and that's what eventually destroys the disk in this calculation. So there was a limit on the mass that you could reduce, that you could get to the star, independent now of how massive the core was made. Um, so this paper is well worth reading for the depth to which it went in understanding grain properties, multi-frequency radiative transfer. Um, it's still a, a landmark paper in my view in this field. And it is, was detailed and physics-y enough to act as a very good base for subsequent studies. Okay. So that's what's happened now. So the uh, work then, this kind of paper motivated these two studies basically here. Uh, Krumholtz and Al decided that they could evade this, have uh, somehow mass limit Reference on Earth bound by, by in their simulation here, this is edge of face on, edge on, this, um, this uh, collapse going on at various times. Uh, at this point, we are at about 48,000 years, uh, 39, 37, back in time. The disk is growing, reason is you have a rotating object, the material collapses in, the most angular momentum material falls in first, follows by the larger and larger angular momentum, falls at larger and larger scales. A simple analytic calculation tells you the rate at which this disk grows in radius. Okay, so everything is fine. You start to produce a strong radiation field, and you notice then a bubble being produced here. This is edge on. The disk here is fragmented into a few pieces, and here at about 37,000 years, this breaks up uh, into fingers. Rather the tailor, it's the way it's broken out. That's Instability of trying to support a heavy fluid with a light one, the light one here being the radiation dominated medium. And you see that uh, they, they thought that this process would feed, continuously feed mass back to the disk, allowing ongoing accretion. That was the idea. So whether these instabilities occurred or not mattered. And uh, in fact, their treatment was with a so called flux limited diffusion. Radiation in dense gas simply diffuses away from the source. But as Kuiper et al. in 2010 pointed out, a very important part of radiation transfer was missed. That's the direct radiation from the star. So if you have a piece of gas sitting here, it should be heated not just from the diffuse radiation field of gas around it, but also from rays that can start from the, from the cloud. Many of these rays might be in the disk are, are essentially very high column density, so not much gets to you. But if you're up here, you see a lot of direct radiation. Ray trace, and that makes the difference. So, if you develop a code in which you put the ray trace plus the diffusion part in your equations, then you find no such instability. There's a time sequence, and for an axisymmetric flow, you see a nice uh, clean bubble here. Uh, there is no fallback, um, this bubble just keeps getting pushed out, and uh, there is no limit in their calculation to the mass of the star can create. Their, limit, their calculation was after symmetric. Um, what we went ahead and did, um, sorry for this talking, if you now go into three dimensions versus two, that disk in two dimensions won't be unstable, it will become gravitationally stable, but not to axisymmetric or non axisymmetric <coughs> instabilities. You won't be able to drive waves, spiral waves, after axisymmetric. In the spiral waves, you can drive strong accretion flows. So it was important to get also in, away from a circular, a spherical coordinate system into one that's more robust. So that challenge was what we took up and worked with uh, Mikhail Floss and here. It's to put a ray trace together with the diffused radiation in the kind of general philosophy of mind by Kuiper et al. But to do this in an adaptive mesh refinement grid, one of the issues was refinement. You remember the Kuiper, the, the uh, Krumholtz work, showed that the disk is fragmented into pieces. Why does this matter? Blue stars have a high multiplicity fraction. Okay. One way of getting that is to think that maybe the disk fragments into pieces. So how a disk fragments is all important in this problem. And you have to pay attention to it. Okay. 
So you do want to be able to resolve to, to keep resolving your grid so you can resolve quite well a local genes mass. That's called the true love criterion here. And that's why we went to an adaptive grid to be able to do this. So source can appear anywhere. Um, where in 3D, any kind of non-axisymmetric mode can appear. The flash code that we use, and it's a great prevalence here in ETA, as uh, one of the working codes in the group, um, uses flash and so on, it's all set to go. So the simulations I'll show you will basically follow, to, first of all, to see how our work compares to these, with 300, 200 solar masses initially. You're going to see our resolution number is about 10 AU. These are like one parsec cores inside a larger box. Temperature is always 200 degrees. With a density profile initially for the gas that is, uh, follows recent observations. The gas is not turbulent, doesn't have an magnetic field. This is, in some sense, a high idealization, but it allows to check out this important part of principle, the physics involved here. What does radiating radio feedback really do? Okay, so here it is. Um, this is work that's now submitted. And uh, so you see the familiar sequence. Here we're starting, we're going 15 to, we go to almost 50,000 years here in the simulation. Uh, again, the disk is growing sideways, looks rather boring, what you expect. And then, boom, here you become uh, gravitationally unstable and now highly asymmetric. You also notice at this stage that we've got a bubble starting to be pushed out here by the radiation pressure. Final snapshot, I'll show you a movie later in my talk. Here you've got a very non axisymmetric disk, uh, here edge on, and uh, kind of a, this is basically kind of a one sided outflow. So, from a completely symmetric starting position problem, we end up with a highly asymmetric problem. And that's because gravitational instability in 3D is allowed to happen. And it likes 3D setups. It doesn't have to be axisymmetric at all. And that breaks the symmetry. Let's look now, by the way, the evolution inside our sync particle, which we use, which is JU. We have uh, we follow the evolution of the star there by um, a sub the physics, if you like to call it that, with the protostellar evolution track. That allows us to compute how much of the luminosity of the sink particle is that comes back out. And here is how things uh, evolve. So this is mass as a function of time for our three models. This is a three solar mass objects model. This is 100 and 200 solar masses. So in this case, we quickly jet up to almost 45 solar masses in about 20,000 years. Here are some other lesson this time. The endpoints here are not doing physics, just our computer. The code just grinds down at this point. You can tear your hair out, but that's what happens with this. So you see that uh, the, there's a break in this accretion. Suddenly, accretion turns on very strongly here and here, not so much here. If you look at the mass accretion history, you notice this fall is this to a maximum here, these three maxima. Um, this you can nicely scale. Think of the problem. You're doing a spherical collapse. So somehow the traditional collapse solutions from decades ago must matter in predicting the accretion rate, and they do. That's this simple formula. The accretion rate scale is C cubed over G. There's a multiplier here which depends on the number of G masses that you put in. It's the famous shoe work. Gary et al. found this scaling. So these three curves have the accretion rates they have simply because we have more genes masses. The scales nicely with the number of genes masses in this initial cloud. So all of this is understandable physics here. Okay? Um, here are protostellar results of the protostellar evolution tracks and velocities. At this point we see things start going crazy and yeah, the accretion rate picks up. Fluctuations of two orders of magnitude uh, increase uh, and that is where the gravitational instability the disk has kicked in. You've been piling up mass in this disk all the while. Something has to give, and the gravitational instability breaks out. You see it at an accretion rate. And here, the velocities, again, two or three orders of magnitude fluctuation in velocities, very highly episodic, less than a thousand years. So let me play here a movie of looking at the disk. and looking 
looking down on the disk here are the streamlines, velocity flows. The disk is very ordered, almost Keplerian at this stage, um, or soon enough Keplerian. And then when the instability breaks out, you see this uh, spiral waves being generated, very strong accretion flows moving along these spiral lines into the center. You'll notice also another thing, there are no other sink particles in this movie. This did not break up into other unstable regions. You have a very highly rapid, a very rapid uh, oscillation, so high accretion rate uh, fluctuations, but none of them condense into another object, into another star. Here's a series of snapshots. So at 100 AU uh, resolution, that's this scale, so we're looking at about 1,000 AU, and this time sequence shown here. And here what we follow that with the QMAP. Now, again, I, I don't know how many students here are here, I presume you've all seen the Q criteria, but if not, a Q simply measures the support of a disk by shear and thermal pressure against self-gravity. If Q is less than one, that means self-gravity wins and you become unstable. So here's a Q map shown down here, and you see initially for a disk there it becomes a region White is a value of 1, so we become too unstable as the column density of the disk is built up. And then this very strong, unstable, asymmetric region goes up afterwards. Why don't we develop other particles? I'll get to that. So I'll try to lead you right towards that. Here is the behavior of disk mass and stellar mass. So for our three models, You see that the star mass, uh, first the disk dominated for a few 10,000 years, the stars actually dominated by the disk. The two grow together, and at a certain point, oops, the, the star just sort of keeps on growing, the disk settles down to some constant kind of mass, feeding the accretion rate that's going through it, building the star, but itself remaining kind of a stationary state. You see that also in the other models here, kind of flattening the disk mass while the star continues to grow uh, without limit, limited only by the, uh, by the reservoir. Here are the final masses that we got so of the star and disk in the 30 solar mass. So we got about a 6 solar mass star with a 3 solar mass disk. Pay attention to these numbers. We got a 29 solar mass star and a 16 solar mass disk. And the, the heavier one, we've got uh, here a 44 solar mass star with an 18 solar mass disk. This goes very nicely with the observations of the disk that I showed you a number of slides ago, which had a 26 solar mass uh, star surrounded by a 12 solar mass disk in the data I just showed you. I didn't emphasize enough in my introduction. So this seems to fit. <clears throat> here is the episodic accretion. This dashed line uh, that these models shows as function of time what the value of the, uh, where the Eddington critical luminosity is, and you see the accretion pi brings up. There comes a point where you become super Eddington and the bubble is launched near that point. And I'll just close this. <laughs> Is there a limit to the mass of some kind? Kuiper uh, et al. showed that uh, for their different models here, um, which are 60, 120, 240, etc., mass cores, plot the accretion rate as a function of mass. Take the 120 solar mass model, after here about 430 kilo years, you've ended up with a, nearly a 60 solar mass star. But the mass you're starting to end up just depends on the mass of the reservoir you put in. There's no fundamental limit here other than that. In our calculations, you see the same trend over for shorter times, but if you compare our 100 solar mass to this one, you can see the effect of the disk accretion has really popped up the level of the accretion rate compared to this model, which just shows a continuous descent and not this bump that comes from the disk accretion. So the accretion disk is having a major role in feeding the star here. Because that's where a lot of material ended up. <clears throat> I 
want to show you now the, uh, the dynamical aspects of this. What I'm going to show you here is a movie showing the velocities of inflow, accretion, and outflow in one movie that I'll explain as you see it. So this is a polar angle. Looking from the disk, 90 degrees is here in this plane, okay? In this coordinate system. So in this plane, you can, here we have negative velocities, so negative velocities of stuff flowing in, positive are flowing out. At the disk plane, you see a lot of velocities here hovering near um, zero. That means there's no strong radial <coughs> inflow of velocity occurring. Um, it's, uh, at this point. So this is measuring the radial velocities of all points. So, um, you see out to the wings, that's so looking away from the disk plane, above and below it. At the end of the simulation, the blue is lower density material, uh, red is high density gas. So blue, dense, blue gas here, very low density, is being shot out above and below the plane in these outflows. So let me just play that again. You get the sense of this method of showing all of the data in one, one fell swoop. Um, so. <clears throat> showing how accretion works and the density of material it's accreting in red and the outflow, which is tends to be lower density material in blue symmetry that you see in this wobbling disk here and the largely one-sided outflow dominated by this material flowing out of these angles. Uh, with 200 solar mass object, here's the way the bubble evolves. Again, nice and symmetric. And then showing a short series of snapshots here showing you the single star here and the, the velocities and the, the vectors here showing the outflow speeds reaching this is heated material from the disk reaching 60 kilometers per second or more, uh, driven by super Eddington uh, velocities. And a number of bubbles, this episodic behavior in the disk translates into a number of eruptions and bubbles being blown off. So I will just show you that. And, uh, <clears throat> so here is the Again, the NGLR rather boring view until we get into stability into this 200 solar mass model. Now, very large uh, radiation driven cavity being driven, still in the early phases, but you see these multiple bubbles of structures here. There's no evidence of a rally to our instability, although our resolution isn't what we would like to have, but neither did Crumholtz at all. Uh, they have the same, probably a similar resolution as we have 10 astronomical units, so we do not see this. Uh, this relative to the in agreement with the corporate other results. So, to your question, why didn't this fragment um, take us far away on the disk? Shown here. Um, and there are the questions about getting fragments to form. And can, it isn't just a question of gravitational instability of the gas. It's a well known aspect of it. This has worked out very well in theory of plant, massive planet formation. You also need to cool that fragment that you created rapidly enough so it can condense. So the obvious criterion is that the cooling time should be less than the dynamical time scale by some factor that you need numerics to figure out. For Gamma shearing blocks, that number is three. So rapid cooling in addition to uh, it's the gravitational instability. Uh, there's a long history to doing simulations with this. This beta parameter is a constant for disks typically and varies. It depends on the equation of states. It's actually a rather complicated piece of physics to figure this out. But let's step back from that and say, ask ourselves, let's suppose we set up a simulation of a radiatively heated disk. We've got cooling going on, the radiation providing the heating right here in this uh, paper by Rogers and Watson, and my uh, colleague and my master and his student. So then in their disk simulations, um, they found a different criteria. For the fragmentation of this spiral wave, the question here is having a piece of gas in a spiral arm 
sufficiently self-gravitating that it beats the shear that it's trying to take it apart. That's like a hill, that's a hill's type of relation, a hill sphere. And this is a little calculation that you do, that the size of this region should be smaller than uh, twice the hill sphere in order for, and so this ratio should be one or less in order to have this region collapse in this radiated heated disk. And we went into our simulation and measured the values of this ratio and found them to be about typically three times above the instability threshold. So that is the reason we feel that it doesn't find them. That's because the radiation succeeded in heating the disk up. So it's not as, the spiral arm isn't as condensed as it might otherwise be, as it ever did Krumholz and how far it was. But we do feel that trying to make the case that the radio treatment is, is not as general as this one. Turbulence and magnetic fields will change this picture. This, if you put in turbulence and magnetic fields, this is what a 100 pixel and mass collapsed object starts to look like. And this is something that lies ahead of us. If we try to block the radiation transfer code together with this simulation, it's Daniel Seifry, student uh, Ralph Besson, and Willie and myself understanding the collapse information of disks in a turbulent MHD environment. Multiple filaments bringing material down on the disk, yet still having an ordered Kepler disk forming inside of it. So, the ultimate calculation, try to imagine radiating feedback into a medium like that. Let's go on then to, so the summary here is that there doesn't appear to be a mass reservoir that's set by radio feedback, it's just the original gas reserve to start with. Star formation efficiencies are in, uh, at least in this range from models of the per free fall time with 36% efficiency. There's no fragmentation, no RT feedback, and the, there's a very primary role that the disk is playing here um, and not fragmenting. So, so this leaves an interesting question behind if it didn't fragment. Where are those, where's the full star multiplicity fraction? Let's go now to the next scale. So we've exhausted the single star fraction. Let's go up to the scale of the cluster itself and what the radio feedback is doing there. Here, uh, you expect that the genes mass is being uh, affected. The heating of the disk uh, raises the genes mass, so all the fragmentation scales um, should be at higher masses. This should suppress the formation of low mass stars. And in this simulation by uh, Bate et al., you see, the, I'm sorry, um, you see that effect of putting radiation on and off. The number of low mass objects that you form in this cumulative distribution is different. So you can suppress the formation of too many ground dwarfs in this calculation by simply raising the genes mass. In a step going towards cluster formation, let's take a look at the collapse of a thousand solar mass object. Here is Thomas Peters uh, and, and people here. And here you will see for that larger scale, a larger mass scale now, thousands of nearly, uh, getting close to many hundreds of genes masses. Fragmentation in this calculation is broken out. And in the, in the disk that's formed, and you'll note here the Q map. Uh, you'll see the fragments in regions of lower Q here um, in this calculation. Then there's a competition going on between these mass centers. So there's a limitation of the mass that can occur because they're competing with one another. Not, that was not in the calculation I just showed you. So here's a first inescapable effect of multiplicity that we need to think about in a cluster environment. Over here, by the way, is the same kind of plot of the star mass going up here for several models, and here you see the disk mass, which is in two models, split out and become constant, much as we saw in our own simulation. Um, so the radio feedback then is what limits the cluster mass on these, um, in this calculation here by Dalladell, the ionized gas that's been heated by these massive stars is shown in blue in this filamentic region. And in this calculation, there hasn't been much done to disrupt the whole cloud. If that hasn't occurred, 
has there been a limit set on the accretion onto the clusters that are forming here or not? And that's where the thesis work of, uh, of Corey Howard, who is in the audience here, who is visiting here for a month, comes into play. So let's first of all build ourselves. Let's, we cannot resolve physically all these scales of the So we're going to put all the cluster action inside a cluster sink. This cluster sink is going to be equipped with certain kind of properties. Gas accretes into the sink, and once it's in there at a efficiency of 20%, we draw at random off of, off of a, a Chabrier initial mass function the distribution of stellar masses. And you assign those masses. You let more matter accrete. A little while later, you tally up how much gas you have, and you want to do this again. So you gradually build up an IMF, or populate an IMF. In this line of calculations, if you start, here's your initial IMF. If you start with a clump that never accretes and has only 100 solar masses, you never sample massive stars. You always end here at a few solar masses. You simply have a very little chance of finding a massive star. If you go to a clump that has 1,000 or 10,000 solar masses, however, you almost fill out the mass function. If onto these regions, however, you accrete the material, then there's no problem if you're accreting at high rates, 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3 solar masses a year, then you'll fill out these mass distributions. So that's the way the cluster sink works. Uh, and the, this is just a theoretical model showing, um, as an example, how the luminosity will uh, evolve in your model with time. In a case where you have no net accretion in blue, and then a clump that continues to accrete at varying rates. Okay? You're building up more and more stars, and here's the luminosity history then of your cluster sink as the IMF gets put in place and as it's built up over time. So you don't have a bomb going off all at once, the way many simulations do, which at some point is kind of declared that for early simulations that I convert so much to an IMF and I just let it go. And the bomb, depending on how you do it, can be extremely um, dangerous. Um, so you have to take care as to what that model actually is. If you do that, then put that in sort of that dynamical simulation. So now we're going to have re radiant feedback in clouds with this range of masses, characteristic densities for clouds, sizes of boxes. We're feeding here, we're not doing a hybrid probe. Here we're doing Thomas Peters, just pure ionization plus radiation pressure acting on the gas in this calculation. Our sequence of models is to look in a distribution of models with varying masses and real parameters. The key question here is how bound is the gas going to be gravitationally when the star formation starts? A very poorly bound cloud, you might expect to form no stars at all, naively. <clears throat> and a very bound one would be successful. Bound one, lots of stars, maybe there's lots of dynamite, maybe there's lots of feedback that would blow this apart. Is that correct? Um, so here's a bound uh, cloud simulation where the alpha parameter is very low, much lower than typical clouds you see in the galaxy by a factor of two. And over here is a cut in the density. This, we've shown all the same particles. These range from 100 particle stellar masses to a few thousand, a few tens actually to a few thousand. You see the background of the clouds seems to be contracting or collapsing, dragging these filaments with it into the center, and you see what looks appear to be like the formation. It's a number of clusters, but it looks like you're headed towards the formation of a, a real monster in there. In a 3D simulation, this is what that looks like in a 3D visualization. And, uh, it's very time consuming to prepare, but uh, Corey did a great job of putting this together. Um, you're going to see rotation of this red, our ionization regions. This is a 10 to 6 solar mass cloud that's massive at Dale and Bunnell. Uh, we're using very dense gas. You see it's filamentary, the green. Okay. Uh, you see the ionized regions in red here. They're is a region of filamentary flow can gush into it, we can quench it again. And you see that indeed we haven't destroyed the whole cloud here. 
Far from it. <clears throat> Let's look at an unbound cloud. Why should you expect spark formation there? Well, let's look at the Virial theorem. The Virial theorem tells you that the Virial parameter, the ratio of the, of the uh, twice the kinetic energy of gravity, when in this simple form, it depends on how turbulent it is, sigma squared, for a given mass. So if I fix the mass and imagine cranking up the, uh, a more and more unbound cloud, has a much higher velocity dispersion. Well, high velocity dispersion means stronger shocks. Stronger shocks means the gas is more, much more readily compressed than the bound cloud. So although the bound cloud is much denser, it doesn't have the advantage of the same amount of compression on some of the gas. Because Mach numbers can differ by, you can mean Mach numbers of 70 in that kind of gas compared to tens in the other one. Those compressions or when gas gets gas together and make the stars actually, in the turbulent fragmentation picture. So it matters very much what that is. So here, we'll do a movie for this rather unbound cloud, and we will see. Here, the density cut to the center, and you see all the filaments, and a rather different picture. The background is not collapsing, rather the background kind of spread out a bit more, as you'd expect. Many, many clusters forming along here. Uh, there's, and indeed, there seems to be like a major fluidimentary structure running through this in here, as some observations have shown. Um, nothing centrally collapsed. If the temperature structure shows you that in the voids there are now regions of rather warm, if not hot gas, that are formed in these voids. And uh, you know, the cloud has survived this and uh, is merely making star clusters. Here's the global evolution of the clouds. So, in the unbound cloud case, this is the total mass of the star you see has been gradually declining by about a quarter, by 25% of the simulation. The mass in the sink particles has been growing, and the gas fraction has been decreasing as we've been doing this uh, calculation. The history of the virial parameter is interesting. Um, in the unbound cloud, which starts at 3, as we blow off, the turbulence blows off some of the unbound gas, we become less and less bound, but the gas that remains now uh, is pulled in by gravity, and you definitely get this descent back to a uh, realized type of mark. So if you ask yourself then, our burial parameter, how bound the cloud is, how does that affect cluster evolution? Let me just focus. So here is the evolution in time of the most massive clusters in these three types of models. Okay. They reach similar kinds of masses. In this case, a few 10,000 solar masses in the green of the recovery observations for our molecular clouds in our galaxy. If you look at the efficiency here, this is the curve I want to draw your attention to. Um, in the unbound cloud, which is here, I'm showing, we're showing the fraction of gas that's in the dense clumps, which is this curve, drawing in time, reaching a fraction of about 30% of the mass of the cloud. This is the fraction of gas that's in stars. It's an efficiency of star formation, which never reaches, kind of reaches about 10% in here. This is kind of in line with what the observations are showing us about the, how much dense gas and the efficiency of star formation within a molecular cloud. It's a little bit high, but not much. It's in the ballpark. This, uh, I have just a few slides left here, but I can't resist showing you as we create clusters, there's going to be end body dynamics setting in between these objects. As the gas disappears, they become more and more end body and the particles interacting with one another. So there's a dynamics associated with that collection of particles which is shown here, which is showing the radial velocities. Okay. Function of position in the cloud. So you see points popping up where they form, the radial position. And here's the radial velocity they have, negative, positive. And you see the few that come in close interaction with one another, they get popped up here once in a while. But overall, we have the velocity dispersion here, about maybe 10 
10 kilometers a second or more. But this is, again, something you can check against the dynamics of a collection of non clusters. That's exactly the data that we're kind of looking for to suppose them match. <coughs> Second to last slide. Here is the dense mass fraction. Uh, there's a nice work by Mimi uh, K. Lunin and his colleagues trying to measure the dense, dense gas fraction. Uh, here's F. This is 60%, 40%, and clouds of various column densities. Um, and you see that depending on, in this survey, which is objects across the galaxy, um, uh, you see that fractions of dense gas, about 10 to the 4 part of the CC, can actually be quite substantial, 30, 40, 50%. As time goes on over here, here is the mass of the cluster. This is 50% gas fraction. Things beneath that would be very much would be in this realm. And you see, after a few million years, as the gas clears out, this population of objects that start with a high gas fraction do drift down in gas fractions hovering around 50%. It's another way of checking the models against the simulations. And finally, let's look at the grand scale now. About a number of years ago, looked at the star formation rates in clouds of various masses. And you know there's a famous work being done now, galactic scale star formation, in which people are measuring star formation rates how you relate to the masses of gas that are forming stars. Leroy, Dell, etc. Um, you can weigh this line, there's a linear relation between these two, this Dell for extra galactic systems suggesting uh, a constant residence time for gas and uh, stuff from gas and clouds. If you extrapolate that to galactic masses, less than 10 to 6 solar masses, here's the trend. And in this data of LADA, we lay our own simulations in here. Either unbound cloud or more bound. And you can see where these will be done for more masses to fill this out as the spark. But it looks very um, Possible that, we're, that our star formation is predicted by these calculations also makes some sense. So I'd like to conclude with a little bit of time. But on the section of feedback on clusters, I've shown you how radiant feedback can be important. It depends on the environment, depends on how bound your system is in the first place. Uh, so that's this important point. Uh, it depends on boundedness and on cloud mass. These are parameters we're currently exploring. It looks as if star formation should get started when systems are being assembled. This turbulent picture of galactic turbulence, star formation can get started long before a cloud actually becomes formed with the gravitation of that. This is a view that's very much held, say, with Ralph Klesson and his group and other researchers here in Heidelberg. But it seems very much very clear from a, you know, an idealized, stylized kind of analysis that we're doing here. Cluster properties, see the match dense fractions, etc. We'll be looking further into this. Overall message, I think, is that the, the, the feedback problem actually has multiple scales to it. Um, and these, these talk back to one another in an interesting way. And uh, that leads to the conclusion that is much more interesting than to be done. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So, it's usually we will have questions first from the students and postdocs. Yes, please go ahead. Um, you have mentioned the, uh, the fact of the initial rotation uh, of the cloud, does it have an effect on the final mass? So, because the Kuiper's uh, simulations, there was a uh, single uh, cloud collapse and forming the star, there was the time on the a rotation rate, I suppose, the final mass of the star? Um, I, I, Kuiper and uh, Wolf doesn't think there's a strong effect with rotation. You're right, because rotation is a more and more angular momentum. You can grow larger and larger disks. The question is, as you grow a larger disk, can you produce fragments out here? Um, 
And in all honesty, we're, we're investigating this. We have not a thorough check on the test, but I don't think the results are going to change too much. Turbulence isn't a big factor here. The best way to do these calculations is not by initiating some rigid rotating sphere, but is to recognize that in a turbulent fragmentation picture, a piece of turbulence has no net angular momentum. You've got a large enough scale that you, you know, each little piece of it does. And as you form a disk, you're collapsing material at different amounts of local angular momentum into this. So you can create a disk with zero net angular momentum in the box. And I think that's the better way to think about this. And these is rather um, some of our artificial emission states. Yes, you may. So the second question was, uh, I didn't quite get why the uh, tumor criterion, which also includes shear, yes. uh, doesn't capture that uh, stability. In, uh, you you see mean the condensation? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are, I think it's important to understand what, what Rogers and Wadsley did. It's a numerical result that they found, they checked against many simulations. The uh, important in that calculation to understand is you have to have done the proper gradient transfer into the disk. You've had to heat it, you've had to put in the right cooling, and then in that system that you've prepared, it's basically taken care of how it heats and cools. Then you go in and ask this, this question of instability or not, and that's what they came up with. Whereas the gamma model kind of you don't do that. You, you, know, you, you state, well, the cooling will be this. You, know, you haven't prepared the state in that particular way. I think that's the difference. That's the answer to your question. <clears throat> so let's open up the podium to questions from everyone. Further questions? Yes, then. So as the mass of stars in your simulations grow, their luminosities evolve. Are, they, are, are those luminosities tied to some um, stellar evolution model or yes. an interpolation of stellar evolution tracks? Yeah, they are. Um, I lost the slide now, but um, underneath, so there is a, uh, there's a stellar evolution model in the same particle that we developed following uh, Hoffner et al. And Hoffner and Carl Holtz itself, so it tells you the radius for a given mass, the radius, the luminosity, and as you continue to accrete into that, um, the model fades accordingly. So there's a little jag in the luminosity evolution that's a feature of uh, actually a first star evolution track, which I can put imagine. But that underlies this. And then there's also an accretion luminosity on, on top of that. So there's a stellar component of accretion luminosity. And basically, the problem is what? The fluctuations will all do the, to the disk accretion in the orders of magnitude, but underlying it is that rising velocity of the star. Yes, I would like to go back to the question that Amy asked about the binaries. What, what is in your perspective, perspective the way to understand that massive stars always are in binary as well? That you so that it's quite difficult to fragment with this. What's the way forward for understanding this higher binary picture? So, uh, in my simulation, admittedly, we could run longer in time. Um, but every indication is that at the same time that Krumholz looked at, our own simulation remains stable on this 100 solar mass type object collapse. Um, I think maybe a, a possible answer to this is that you have to think of this as forming not as an isolated O star. No, no O star forms in isolation. Uh, they'll be forming in a cluster environment. And then you can go to the Peters et al. calculation, which I showed, where you've got a thousand, more like a cluster mass. Take something, a clump mass of a thousand bigger that you're collapsing. There, there may be more opportunities for fragmentation, uh, which that calculation showed. Um, so I would argue from at least what, what I know about these two problems, now is that the binarity arise from that. Um, but um, the caveat to all of this is that we'd like to put turbulence into our own model here to see what happens then. Now, here's important to the MHD. The MHD is as important as preventing fragmentation as radiation heating is. Because a magnetic field penetrating the disk simply performs and not provides another kind of pressure which supports the disk, making it 
less prone to fragment into pieces. Okay. So I think to do the turbulence problem correctly with MHD, I think again we'll find a situation where this will be, my guess, fairly stabilized. And then the answer will be more something dynamics on some larger scale, some clump cluster scale that's going to resolve this. And then how do you get them to go together? Because some massive stars are very tight binaries. So how do you how do you actually get those massive stars then to go together? I personally haven't thought about that. I haven't thought that about that. But I think that's an excellent question then. People and we know from um, that binaries can be tight and that whole stars have a very high binary fraction. But we do know also that most stars do mass enough clumps. You know, they, the density of the star is very high. Um, so that needs to be reflected in not just a hundred cylinder <coughs> isolated object collapse, but in something much more massive. Um, the observers always have difficulties to get a good handle on the accretion rates. I mean, we, we might see but, infall rates from the clump to something in the inner region, but not to the star, to the forming star. So how are the accretion rates in your simulations when there is an episodic outbreak and when it's in quiescence? So just to mm -hmm. get a feeling for the numbers involved there. Let me just toss out that slide for you. Is this and synchronized with the stellar evolution model you have put, put in or, or yeah. is it possible? Yeah, okay, it is synchronized, but so is it is an answer to your question. So here is the luminosity, but if you wanted the accretion rate, I can show you that. So you can't read it from back there, but this comes up uh, for the most massive, let's say the 100 solar mass case, okay? The peak of the accretion rate um, is, is getting towards 10 to minus 3 solar masses per year. By the way, that's an interesting number because um, if you take a, a 10 to minus 3 solar masses and greater, if you have an accretion like that, that can actually quench the steel, that can actually push a radiative bubble down according to Wolf, Wolfire. That's an LA calculation. But here you are at those accretion rates. Instability kicks in. And um, then you see fluctuations between this 10 to minus 3. Even I can't do this. Sorry about this. 10 to minus 2 here, okay? Turn 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 2, two orders of magnitude fluctuations. The resolution here, this is uh, the resolution 1 million, little 1 kilo year. So the fluctuations here can be less than a kilometer of duration. This kind of ties in interestingly to the calculations that Rubia and, and Basu were doing on the static accretion and understanding the velocity problem for stars. Um, here it is. And as I said, a simple way to think of these accretion rates is just to scale, first of all, with this scaling to get you into the ballpark, and then the disk accretion on the other side again, varying from that up. Yeah, I'm always going to answer your question. Yeah. Okay, let me also use the second one question. So, on the faster scale, your seed particles are not point particles. So, their dynamic interaction should not be modeled by point particles, but yeah. by some kind of particles that have internal degrees of freedom that experience tides and so on. Yeah. That would translate themselves into the velocity. Is this taken to count? No, but I think that's a great PhD problem. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're dead right. There's an internal structure to that that needs to be, if you could put that in, then it'd be really interesting to equip your subgrid with the dynamics. And uh, that would make a more interesting thing part of it. That might soften some of the <laughs> yeah. so, so, if you want to sign up as a graduate work on this, just let us know. So let us thank Ralph Kubitz again for talking about massive star emission.